nine and a half out of 10 times, especially, especially when I'm talking to young women, all young women, not just young women of color, all young women, I always hear, I need a mentor. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. At our 2022 Retail Innovation Conference and Expo, we had Kimberly Lee Miner speak on the power of mentorship and sponsorship and why retail organizations need both if they want to cultivate a culture of diversity and innovation. Kimberly has more than 25 years of senior and C-suite leadership experience working for companies like Bath & Body Works, Nine West Group, and Taylor and & Talbots. Today, she serves as CEO of Bumbershoot, a boutique consultant firm that provides cultural and market insights to support inclusive, equitable, and diverse representation, and she's the founder and president of WOC Retail Alliance. Her firsthand experiences deep connections in the industry, and her passion for community connection and data back strategy all make her the perfect source of guidance on this crucial topic. That's why we're excited to collaborate with Kimberly again for 2023. She'll be returning to Chicago to host a workshop on how retail executives can truly actualize equity in their organizations. It'll be a 90-minute deep dive session and discussion, making it the perfect follow-up to this presentation you'll be listening to today. If you like what you hear and want to learn more about the work that Kimberly is doing, check out the show notes for more info. But for now, listen in and enjoy the session. So before we jump into this presentation, um, you know, we said that DEI is really important. And if this was, um, what's the date today? May 11th, right? My, my parents' anniversary, I should know that, oof. Um, if this was June 11th, 2020, this room would be full. And yet maybe there are 10 people here, which says a lot about where we are. And so when I, when I think about my journey and I, and I think about my experiences, my experience has been as a business leader, not as a DEI expert. But after 25 years of being a business leader and being the only or the first with every company that I've worked with, I left corporate America, went back to school, went to Wharton to brush up on my MBA, and then I went to Stanford to learn the academic side of leveraging inclusion and equity for organizational excellence. And so I stand here today um, as someone who, for the past five years, has worked in that area, as well as business development. And so I am, in addition to the CEO of Bumbershoot, I am also the president of a company you might know called Bandier. And so, Bandier is a fashion company, high-end fashion company in uh, women's activewear, New York City based. And I got there through this because they cared enough that they wanted someone who understood business and understood how to incorporate inclusion and equity into their business. And by working with them over the past three years, I became president. And so I wanna talk about that. It's not separate. It's not HR. It's what we, it's us. It's what we, what we should all care about. And it shouldn't have been a moment in 2020 or 2021. So let's start, okay? So what should it look like in your organization? I still talk to people who don't know the difference. They don't know what DEI stands for. They just know People are talking about it, so I better have some check, <laughs> some boxes, buy it, and make sure I do something with it, but I don't know what it is. So let's just talk about it. I, I won't make any assumptions. I'm just gonna give some information. And it's a small group. I know we're not supposed to do Q&A, but it's a small group, so if you have questions, I'm good with it. Please ask questions. Um, so when you think of diversity, and, and especially coming off of 2020, it was really just very binary. 
and it was about race. But when you really understand what diversity is, it covers race, gender, differently abled. Any differences that we have are our diversity. But it's the best part of being human because we're all different. And we could bring so many different perspectives if we weren't afraid of each other. Right? And so diversity is a given. We, we are a diverse society. It's a given. Equity is when we make sure that in our practices, in our processes, in our decision making every day, that we include equity. Now, when I talk to people also, they say, well, it should be equal, not just equitable. Like, what is equity? It should be equal. Well, here's an example of the difference. Let's say you guys are working late, and you're a boss, and you're like, oh my goodness, everyone's working late, and I, I, they're probably hungry. I'm going to order pizzas for everybody. And I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to have cheese pizza. I'm going to have pepperoni pizza. I'm going to have you know, veggie pizza. And I'm going to make sure that everybody can have two slices of pizza. But there's someone who works for you who has a dairy allergy or gluten, has a gluten um, sensitivity. Can they have that pizza? They can't. So it wasn't equitable. It was equal because it was enough for two people, everybody to get two slices, but it wasn't equitable. And the difference is when you make resources available to everyone. And so your practices and your processes are available for everyone. Doesn't have to be equal, has to be equitable. You need to meet your team where they are. And then the third, the I of DEI is inclusion. That should be pretty simple. But that's probably the hardest thing. Because we tend to include people that we build relationships with. And we build relationships with people that we have things in common with. And if we don't naturally have things in common with everyone that we work with, which we won't, then there's always going to be someone who's left out. That's where the problem comes. Remember this. Diversity is a given, right? In equity is necessary, and it must be intentional. Inclusion is the gold standard. So I've given you a lot of information on why it's important. It's important for a lot of different reasons. There are a lot of things on here, but what's most important about this slide here is that every day we move further and further into the future, every day. And so the generational mix in your, wor in your workplace and your ecosystem changes. And so your employees are looking for more than just a job. Gener gener generationally, your employees are looking for something from you as the employer, right? And generationally, it's different. So if you were a boomer, I don't see any boomers in the room, but if you're a boomer, then it was about your leadership is ethical, right? And, and that's, you know, ethical, OK? And the organization cared about your well-being. Well, well-being meant something very different 25 years ago than it means now, right? And your organization had financial stability, because generally, where you worked is where you wanted to retire from. That's different now. Then we go to Gen X. I'm a Gen X. And it was kind of the same, because my parents instilled in me what my work ethic should be. And this is what you look for in a job. All, even though I'm a Gen X, I think I'm more millennial, because I, once I got there, I was like, oh, that's not right. I don't agree with that. I'm not doing that. I'm questioning it. I'm questioning it. And, and I am the person, my father used to, he's like, could you please not ask why today? Could you just give me one break? <laughs> so <laughs> just, but then as we get into millennials and with younger millennials and Gen Z, the priorities change. Of course, there's still, you want financial stability because you want to make sure that your paycheck cashes at the end of the week. 
Um, but you want to know that not only is your leadership ethical, like it doesn't have to be number one, but you can trust them. So what they say is what they mean, and they walk the walk, not just talk the talk. But, and well-being means something very different today. Well-being really means well-being. It's not just vacation. If you're having a hard day, I want to be in an environment where you care about that. And maybe you give me the day off. Or maybe it's OK for me to take a walk, and you're not looking for me to be at my desk. Or maybe you offer me support because I'm going through something. That's the difference. Boomers and you know, Gen X, we left all that in the parking lot. Now it comes in. It comes in every day. We see it. And we have to figure out how to deal with it. And then with Gen Z and the younger millennials, you add on top of that that they definitely want organizations that are diverse and inclusive on every level. And in this retail environment that we work in, we see a lot of diversity with our independent contributors. But even a store line or in a corporate environment, once you get to manager, it changes drastically. So I just want you to see, this is what your workforce is going to look like, right? Right now, 2020, obviously Gen Z is the smallest, right? But you've got Gen X and your millennials taking up most of it. By the time we get to 2030, boomers are almost gone. So are you ready for that? Are you ready to say you have an inclusive and a diverse organization? Are you ready to admit that you're not? And what do you want to do about it, right? Why is it important? So I can send out this. I'm not going to go through all the details. But I think visually, you can see how if we take that last slide, when we look at age, right, and how the age curve is, and then we apply it to race and ethnicity, it's changing. And it doesn't mean just bring in people in those other groups. It means get ready. Be ready to accept them. I have worked for organizations where they said, well, they didn't fit the culture. Well, what culture is that? Right? What do you want your culture to be? How do you make a culture so that everyone can be successful? Right? If your culture is based on the 65-year-old white man sitting in the front office and you're interviewing Hispanic women or Asian women, well, what culture are we talking about? We have to get real. We have to get real about the conversation, and we have to get real about what we're, what we're talking about. Because this video, what does it look like? Do you see how these numbers go down? It's a problem. Because that's not what the world looks like. That's not what our demographic is in the United States. So why would we put up with that? Why would that be OK? Why wouldn't we say, why? And then the more we say, why, what are we going to do about it, right? So let me give you a little more information. And I'm going to focus on women. OK, so we hear about women making you know, unprecedented gains. In the last um, graphic, Women moving into the C-suite has increased almost double. Amazing, right? Yay! So good, so good. Look, 48, 46%. So good. So amazing. But let's go under the covers. Again, gender parity does not mean gender parity. And gender advancement doesn't mean for everyone. And unfortunately, we live in this society where we talk in bold terms and we look at the best numbers to make us feel good. But when we get down to the details, look at this. Minorities, so different, 13%. And I think that is generous. And then when we look at S&P, it's 21%. But what we don't see here is that that was, a, that was from individual contributor to manager and maybe director. 
and then it goes to three. That's a problem, right? So, of course, my favorite question, why? Why? Do we ever ask that why? I, here, I want to stick with this for just a minute. And, and, I, and I talk about this with a lot of people, <laughs> obviously, because it's why. But why is the source of everything? When you look at, when you're selling to your customer, right? You need to know the why of why a consumer would want to buy your brand to become your customer. Because your consumer knows when they want to engage. You need to know why and what they will engage, right? So why is a really big question. It's an important question. And when we talk about theory and critical theory, of course, we say critical race theory, but it's critical theory to me. So it's critical gender theory. theory. It's criti there is critical race theory. There's critical why, why does the C-suite look like this and not like this? It's all about why. Ask why. And then don't let it go if you don't like the answer. Right? Keep asking why until you have a, an answer that is measurable and actionable. Okay, here, this, this illustrates what it feels like when you've made a conscious decision in your office to say, we're going to be diverse. So we're going to find that unicorn, because you're still that thought that there can't be more than one amazing person who doesn't look like me, <laughs> right? right? And that person comes into your organization. And because they are different, and because you haven't taken the time to make your organization welcoming, this is how they feel. So they might be there, but this is how they feel. And so this quote, just when I read it, it blew me away because I could relate to it. I could relate to it every day. It is the, it is the worst feeling you can feel to work for a company and give everything you have and feel like you still are outside and that you still have to prove yourself every day you walk in. So I've been giving you a lot of facts. Whoops. There we go. So what are we going to do with all that information? Why is it important? So we're going to talk about mentorship. And, and when you see this video, I think you're going to think, you're going to know what I feel about mentorship. But in your organizations, you do need to do the work to create a welcoming environment. And so when I am working with other companies and I'm asking young people, um, diverse groups of young people who haven't gotten to that level, but want, they have aspirations to grow their career. And I said, well, what do you think you need? What would really help you get there? And I, nine and a half out of 10 times, especially, especially when I'm talking to young women, all young women, not just young women of color, all young women, I always hear, I need a mentor. Why not? Do. Or do not. There is no try. I never saw your future, only its possibilities. You have such a capacity for goodness. Arrogance and fear still keep you from learning the simplest and most significant lesson of all. Which is? It's not about you. You don't know about real loss. Because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. True courage is about knowing not when to take a life, but when to spare one. Because some men aren't looking for anything logical, like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men 
just want to watch the world burn. Either you karate do yes or karate do no. You karate do guess so. Just like grip. There is a deep magic more powerful than any of us that rules over all of Narnia. It defines right from wrong and governs all our destinies. Yours and mine. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. What? Oh! 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 <laughs> Any other questions? Dark and difficult times lie ahead. Soon we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. Remember this. You have friends here. You're not alone. Is that what we really need? <laughs> Did you get anything from any of that? Those were the best mentors out there. They made billions of dollars. There's a difference. Diverse approach, diverse people. There's a difference between a mentor, a sponsor, and an ally. People say, well, what? What is that difference? Don't I need a mentor? Of course, have a mentor. Your friends could be your mentor, right? You could have, but a mentor, as we just saw, gives advice. A mentor is a trusted advisor. A mentor is someone that you could talk about anything. You know, your date last night, right? How you, coffee was cold. What do I do? Do I tell the cafe, <laughs> right? Right? You, oh, you know, I had a bad day yesterday. I made a few mistakes. What do you think I should do? Mentor is great. It's a sounding board. But there, is a, there are big differences. And the difference, the biggest difference in corporate America between women's advancement and especially women of color's advancement and men's advancement is the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Big difference. Big difference. So I'm going to look over here because there are a lot of women over here. Find a mentor, ask for a sponsor. And as an owner of a company, let's, let's create some sponsorship opportunities, right? Here's the difference, okay. There are benefits, right? You can give, you can personally improve by spending time with your mentor. You can ask personal questions. It's, they're like friendly, you can have coffee. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. They, not, they share knowledge. Right? There's a new process. Have you done it before? Sure, let me tell you about it, right? You know, it's kind of wax on, wax off. You know, it gives you those tools so that you can be better at what you do. It also, we can expose blind spots because your mentor might see things you don't see. So it's great. Great to have a mentor. Here's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. A sponsor is invested. A sponsor has power and privilege. A sponsor uses that power and that privilege to advance you and your career, right? And so you're very connected. So they know mistakes, what you've done, and they're not judgmental because they're invested in you. So they're gonna make sure that that mistake that you made you learn something from it, and you don't make it again. Because they want you to succeed because they have invested in you, okay? They endorse you. There's an opportunity that comes up. Oftentimes, the opportunities that come up are not posted on LinkedIn. They happen in, room, in small rooms. Well, if your sponsor, because most of the time your sponsor is going to be there more often than your mentor. If your sponsor has the power and privilege and is in those small rooms and an opportunity comes up and they've invested in you, whose name are they going to speak about? Whose name are they going to bring up? And then who are they going to say, but because, 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 okay? And 
privilege and power. P privilege and power. Know that. Your sponsor has privilege and power, and that is the rocket fuel that takes your career along with theirs. So that's the difference between mentor, trusted advisor, sponsor, your endorser. They're invested. And then we talk about allies. People talk about that all the time. They, they want to know, well, is there a certain way I should talk, some things I should say. You know, this, this is a great visual, but I'm going to break it down really easy. An ally is someone who will stand in the gap for you. So I'm going to repeat myself. An ally is someone who will stand in the gap for you. And so what do I mean by the gap? Let's just say, I don't know, happens sometimes. You're, in a, you're not in a meeting. They called a meeting. You should have been in the meeting, but you weren't, you weren't considered. So you're not in that meeting. But they're talking about work that you've done. And there are other people in there who are real happy to take the credit because you're not in that room. The ally would stand in that gap between what happened, who did it, and say, oh, oh yeah, that was great work, wasn't it? That was exceptional. And Michael did it. Don't know why Michael's not here today, but Michael did this. That's what ally does. Or another situation, people are out, they're saying derogatory things about your, you or your group, and they think it's cute. They think it's funny, ha-ha, bad joke. But no one, is a, is a, no one has the courage to say, hey, shut the hell up. This is not cool. But an ally would say, hey, I, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't play with that. And that's unacceptable. And if that's who you want to be, I can't be a part of it because that's what, those, are, those are people. They're humans, and you don't, get a right, you don't get the right to talk about people like that. That's what standing in the gap is, right? We all can be allies. We can't all be sponsors because everybody doesn't have the same power or privilege. We can all be mentors, and we can all be allies, and we should all find a sponsor. So that's the, those are the difference. And that's why it's important in understanding how that relates to DEI, right? Because all of this seems personal. And companies bring in DEI professionals into HR. And then they don't give them budgets, right? But they say, we have a chief DEI officer. And more times than not, that chief DEI officer was a person of color who was in a business unit busting their ass to move forward in the company. And the company, instead of saying, we want to really invest because we see the importance of all of this DEI practice throughout the business, they, they take that person out of the business unit, give them the title of chief, and then say, now go fix it. Because you must know, you must know what to do, right? Wax on, wax off. You must know what to do. You're of color. You know what the problems of all people of color or all differently abled or all anybody. You know what the problem is because of who you are. Well, that's not right. So here comes my why. Why would you ask me? I don't know. Before I left corporate America and went back to school, I got called all the time. Particular organization, I won't name them, but I got called every year for their summit to speak on DEI. And I was like, oh, I am running a $4 billion business do you have other women of color who are running $4 billion business? Well, no. But don't you think that, I said, don't you think that'd be more interesting? Don't you think it'd be more compelling to have people who don't think we exist 
see me, hear about my journey, let me talk about some of the hurdles and challenges? Mm, no, we really want you to talk about DEI. I'm like, okay, so guess what? I've never spoken there. <laughs> but DEI is important to me, but it's important to understand. It's not just a thing. Just like you look at your P&L, just like you look at your process, it should go all the way through. Because when it doesn't, here's the result. These are actual facts, right? If you don't invest in your company across the board, not in HR, across the board, and make it a full practice, then there's 40 to 50% productivity re reduction. Do you know why? Do, do, do you know, does anybody know why? The reason is because when you are not included and you're not part of the team, you might have the best ideas, but if for whatever reason, bias, lack of knowledge, whatever, if you don't have a diverse team who can think for the real consumer group out there, because all consumers are not, they're not all white, they're not all old men, they're diverse, right? But if you're not thinking for all of them, then you're only getting one group. So that is revenue. Productivity, people are only going to be an afterthought for so long. You're only going to come work for a company who doesn't appreciate you for so long. So every time you have to retrain a person, fill a role, you lose productivity because you have to build up again build that ramp up again. When if you just created an environment where people work together, and I know it sounds easy, it's not because we have to change a lot of old thinking, but if, if we're in it together and they know they're a part of that process, your productivity goes up because you're a part of it. When I was at Stanford, we did a, a, a white paper, Silicon Valley, and we did blind uh, interviewing where it was, you didn't even know the person's name, it was just their accomplishments, not even the school they went to, the jobs they held and their accomplishments. And then we did traditional recruiting, where you knew the school and all this stuff. And so, of course, one team, Ivy League, they all looked alike, kind of talked alike. Over here, very diverse group. And they gave them projects. And this was all through, you know, firewall. Like, nobody knew what the project, it was the same project, and at the end, they came back together. And this group's project was exceptional. They took it to market in six months, and they sold it for, I think, $20, $20 billion. Small, Google invested in it and said, this is great. I think they're still working on their project. Because they still had, they had one idea. Whereas they had worked through all these different ideas, right? And so I was talking to someone who wanted me to work with them and their recruiter. And the recruiter said, well, I don't understand what you're saying about how we reduce productivity or why we should invest in diversity because the people who ask me to recruit for them tell me they always want the best person. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna need you to repeat yourself. And he said, well, do I want to be diverse or do I want the best? I said, yes, and you should be fired right now, <laughs> right? Yes, we want the best and we want diversity. So I gave him an example. I said, okay, so here are two resumes. You have an internship program. You have one student who is number six in his class. He's a beta gamma sigma um, international Honor Society member. He is a academic scholarship recipient. He is 19. He's a junior. And he just got a scholarship to go to UCLA's Anderson School of Business for the summer as a junior. And there's another person who, um, middle of the class, at Harvard, father went to Harvard, Grandfather went to Harvard. He's in you know, this um, fraternity. 
he did well. He went to a, a good high school, um, but he knows a lot of people. Who do you want in your internship program? And he said, well, I want the one who's going to UCLA. I said, oh, what do you think he looks like? And so he was like, well, I don't know. I said, do you think he's white? He's like, well, yeah. I said, guess what? That's my son. I just described my son. Would you hire him if you had met him? And he's like, oh, probably not. Right. Which leads to this, because then it's a vicious cycle. Right? And, and that's what we have to work against. So we're coming towards the end of our time together. We have to be the change makers, right? Now, this seems really simple. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit, because it's not as simple as it looks. We know that, right? When everything came to a head on May 25th, 2020, everybody wanted to go into action. They didn't know what they wanted to do, but they wanted to do something. And 70% of those who were posting and wanted to do something are no longer doing anything because they just wanted to do something. It's OK to pause. When there's a lot coming at you, if you know you want to do something, take the time, talk to people. Look up people who are in that space of what you want to do. They'll take a call. It's passion. It's, it, it's a passion. So pause. It's OK. You don't have to do something immediately. You have to do something intentionally. You have to do something sustainably. Pause. Then ask yourself what question? Why? Ask yourself, why do I want to do something? Why is this important to me? Why will it be important to the people who work with me and for me? Why would it be important to my customer? Why would it be important to the consumer who I want to be my customer? Build those circles and, and answer, answer those questions for yourself. Right? Take the time. Bring people in. Bring your employees in. You get great answers. Educate yourself. Tons of training programs, not all created equal. A lot of people out there who you know, can copy a training program and <laughs> deliver it. Do your research. Make sure it's someone who works, fits you personally. It's good, because there should be a lot of dialogue. It shouldn't be easy. It should be about a lot of conversation and exchange. So when you're looking to bring trainers in, take the time. Educate yourself, but take the time to bring the right people in who can connect. I have several trainers on my team. And I have one who's an older gentleman. And he's great when we do bank training. He's great. They love him. But when, when I'm working with, like, I do work sometimes with Victoria's Secret. I have a younger guy who's really cute, and they love him, right? And he connects with them, and um, you know, but he can relate, and they can relate to him. Like those are things that are really important. Um, communicate and communicate authentically. I hope you know that standing up here while I'm making a presentation to you, I hope you can get a feel of who I am. Just, I like to show up as me, <laughs> every day is, is much easier, right? And so when you communicate, sometimes I throw people off because I'm very honest. But at least you're not confused, right? So take the time to kind of pause, figure out who you are, right? And then show up as that person every day and communicate. And communication is difficult because I hear from a lot of people I don't know what words to say. I don't want to offend someone. If I ask the wrong question, here's what I say to that. If you are genuine 
in your desire to know more and to connect with people on a more authentic level and to learn about new cultures and, and new ideas, and you ask someone, like you've done some research and you just want confirmation that you're understanding it or you have a question and that person is nasty or has a problem with you asking them, that's their problem. It's not yours. So don't feel like, oh, that means I shouldn't ask anyone, okay? I love when people ask. I'd rather you ask me questions and call me a name because you've made an assumption, right? So don't be afraid to ask those questions. Um, and, and if the first time doesn't work, ask somebody else. And then after you've done all those things, make an action plan. How are you gonna be an agent of change? How are you going to be ready for this next generation? Right? We, we've already kind of blew it on the past generation, so you know, it is what it is. But how are we going to be ready for the next generation? How do we make them the best they can be? Right? How can we support the future? Because the future is here now, and business isn't getting any easier, and relationships with different people, a lot of work that needs to be done. So how do we get ready for that? So I'm going to leave you. I'm at the end of my time, but I'm going to leave you with Mr. Stephen Covey. Strength lies in differences, not in similarities. And if you have a team, think about this for all of my sports fans out here. A team is not made up of all, like a basketball team's not made up of all centers. What would that do? Everybody be jumping for the ball, right? So think about that. Great, well thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up. <laughs>